Hello, everybody, and welcome to Des Moines University's mini medical school, week number one, the COVID-19 vaccine and children, where we started and how it's going, presented by Dr. Amy Shriver. Well, my name is Hannah DeGeest, and I am the Community and Public Affairs Manager at DMU. Some of you might already know me if you're returning mini med school students, so welcome back. I'm so glad to see you again this year. And for those of you who are new, we're so glad you found us, and we hope that you stay tuned and see all that this series has to offer. So tonight, as you're watching this, you might be tuning in live, you might be tuning in at a later date. Either way, I hope that this presentation sparks some questions and you share those with us. Please email those to questions at dmu.edu and we'll be sure to get you an answer. So without any further ado, I would love to introduce you to our presenter. Dr. Amy Shriver received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Northwestern University and her medical degree at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. She was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society and Gold Humanism Honor Society in 2004. She completed her pediatric residency in 2007 at the University of Colorado and went on to become chief resident. Dr. Shriver returned to her home state of Iowa in 2010 to work as a general pediatrician at Blank Children's Pediatrics. Dr. Shriver is an assistant professor of specialty medicine at Des Moines University and an adjunct professor at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. She serves on the executive board of the Iowa chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is the co-chair of the Mental Health Committee and a member of the Legislative Committee. She is the medical director of the statewide nonprofit Reach Out and Read Iowa. Dr. Shriver lives with her husband and 14-year-old and 10-year-old daughters who still enjoy nightly shared reading. Welcome, Dr. Shriver. Hello, my name is Dr. Amy Shriver. Thank you for attending my mini medical school lecture about COVID-19 in children. So this is being recorded in kind of mid-January. So maybe by the time you see this, there will be more updates or things will have changed. Uh, I am an assistant professor of specialty medicine at DMU, and I'm a practicing pediatrician at Blank Hospital in Des Moines. And I'm happy to share a little bit more about what's been going on with COVID in children and COVID vaccines. So this is my daughter and when she got her vaccine and a little bit earlier on when she was having some feelings about COVID. Here are my disclosures. Um, I occasionally work in the community and partner with some organizations, but I'm not discussing anything of uh, commercial interest in my presentation. Today, what I'd like you to learn are some important steps for us as a community to know to protect children from COVID-19. First, we're gonna review the COVID timeline for children, where we started and how it's going. Second, we're going to discuss some statistics of what's happening in our communities, in our state, and in the country with COVID and children right now. Third, we're gonna discover a little bit more about COVID-19 vaccines, how do they work, and then we're gonna discover why they are so critical and important for children. And finally, we're gonna examine some of the myths about COVID vaccines and dispel them and really encourage people to understand more about the science of COVID and its vaccines. So I like to open up with some feelings about COVID. So as a practicing pediatrician, um, 2022 has started off with a bang in terms of the numbers of children we're seeing in our clinic, the volumes in our clinic, and frankly, the number of sick staff and sick providers um, limiting our abilities to take care of everyone. So this is 2021 showing 2022 around. And um, one more meme that says if coronavirus was a person, she would definitely be uh, Professor Umbridge, our least favorite Harry Potter professor. So let's take those steps to learning more about how to take care of children. First step is let's review the timeline. So this is the pandemic years that we've experienced so far. Remember way back in like December of 2019 in January of 2020, we started hearing about a mysterious new illness that was in Wuhan, China, and they were starting to have a number of deaths related to this new virus. And then it started a surge in Europe. 
And then um, slowly, slowly, we made our way towards March, where we had um, a cruise ship having some COVID-19 uh, episodes, and the Bay Area shut down, um, and so we were starting to see COVID enter the United States. Then in the middle of March, the world shut down. Countries were sealing their borders, sports teams were canceling, schools all closed, all the employees stayed home. People started learning the phrase social distancing and people started thinking about wearing masks all the time. Then our efforts were focused on flattening the curve. We knew we couldn't completely eliminate this new virus, but we wanted to stay as healthy as possible in reduce the transmission so that we could prevent the overwhelm of our hospitals and limited resources. So we tried flattening the curve. We tried keeping our grandparents and our elderly citizens healthy, and we really worked hard to not get COVID. Excuse me. Um, then we noticed um, over the course of the year that social distancing was not very healthy for us. We saw a lot of struggles with families who lost their jobs due to COVID. Um, working with home with no childcare was stressful. Having children home and not in school was stressful for both parents and children. And then um, we started um, just really having cause uh, increased mental health issues. And then um, we started noticing that um, there were some vaccine possibilities back in December. So in December, healthcare workers and front frontline workers started getting vaccinated. And there was a new hope at that point. And I remember the day I got my first vaccine, a little, maybe a few tears were shed. Um, so then um, at the beginning of 2021, we thought, okay, this is really gonna be it. We're all gonna get vaccinated and we're gonna watch this thing drop, drop, drop. And really it turns out that we were in for a big surprise. So let's take a look. Um, COVID-19 and children. Children were and are among the biggest victims of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now you might say, well, children aren't dying at as high a rate as grownups, but um, we know that children have suffered in numerous ways other than morbidity and mortality in terms of their learning, their physical health, their emotional health, and um, their grief and loss. There have been so much tragedy in terms of the, what children have been experiencing. And we know that children of color are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. We also know that pediatricians are a key in terms of preventing and mitigating the effects of COVID-19 on children. We're also leaders in our communities for advocacy of safety and vaccine promotion. So let's take a reflective look. How did this whole thing start for kids? Well, remember we were all told to flatten this curve because we wanted the healthcare system to remain functional. So all of our kids stayed home. Here's a picture of my daughter during the first couple months of COVID. We're like, what should we do at home? Well, let's paint rocks and get creative. We're still smiling here, so that's good. Um, let's do some pretend homework. So my daughter wrote a, a cartoon about the Russian revolution just for some learning. And let's appreciate our teachers who uh, were having a rough go of it as well. So we had some parades that were COVID safe where we could drive around and honk and um, show our teachers that we love them. And then we went back to work as pediatricians in the clinic, but we had to wear all sorts of new PPE. We had to wear scrubs again. It was a whole new world for us. And they called us heroes. Thank you frontline workers for risking your lives and helping people who are afraid and who are sick. Thank, thank, thank you for being there to keep us all safe from the virus that's going around. To all the nurses, doctors, EMTs, lab techs, healthcare workers on the front lines, thank you frontline workers. We were getting free donuts. It was, it was a time where we felt very appreciated. Um, then what happened was people stopped coming to the pediatrician. We didn't see people, we didn't see families bringing their children in for well child visits. We didn't see people checking in for their regular medication checks. We didn't see kids that were following up with their speech therapy or occupational therapy. Um, and uh, we had a huge drop in the number of visits and vaccines that were provided to children. Um, this caused a big, a big problem for pediatricians and some pediatricians had to close their doors so we lost a lot of clinics and um, hospitals at that time. 
there is a big campaign of advocacy through the American Academy of Pediatrics. Hey, parenting in a pandemic means um, you might have to call your pediatrician. In other words, don't lean away from your child's health during this uh, very difficult time. Lean into your health, call your pediatrician, ask the questions, go in, make sure your child is getting appropriate health care. Then we started seeing other effects on kids and families. Um, mothers and fathers losing their jobs and cutting their hours and losing their health care. Uh, 140 million children plummeted into poverty thanks to COVID. Child abuse rose. We didn't have as many mandatory reporters seeing those kids. Um, the mental health emergency that was declared in October by the American Academy of Pediatrics and then later in December uh, by the Surgeon General. Um, kids were failing in class. They missed a whole year of school and then going back to school was terrifying for them. Um, COVID lockdowns had children sitting at home and just snacking and snacking and snacking. No sports, no activities, no fun meetings with their friends outside. So we saw a huge rise in childhood obesity. And then we saw um, child care providers losing their jobs, um, daycares closing their doors. And it was a hard time for children, a hard time for parents, and a hard time for those caring for those kids. Um, of course, as I mentioned before, there are huge race, racial and ethnic disparities related to COVID-19. So children of color were experiencing more of these things. Then it was rough to be a healthcare worker. It still is. We saw a lot of our um, colleagues die from COVID-19. Um, provider burnout became a huge thing where every day we went in and we saw more people sick and more people dying. Um, more stats on burnout, more stats on burnout, more stats on burnout. I worry that maybe my burnout cannot be reversed, said one doctor. Burnout deepens for Iowa healthcare workers as Omicron fuels latest COVID surge. Uh-oh, now during Omicron, um, closed hospital floors, sick staff, uh, Alabama hospitals hit by resignations, stretched by Omicron. Hospital cuts beds as nurses call in sick with COVID. Healthcare workers are panicked as desperate hospitals ask infected staff to return. <laughs> All hands on deck. Hospitals report hundreds of staff out with COVID. Southwest Florida hospitals restrict care as workers fall to COVID. Here's how many Sanford Health employees are out sick with COVID. Current COVID-19 surge causing the worst delays of the pandemic, says Iowa hospital leaders. So yes, those of us that haven't caught COVID are stuck on a hamster wheel trying to cover for the other um, of our sick fellows and colleagues that are out and we're stretched to our limit running around on a hamster wheel that seems to get us nowhere as more and more patients come in with COVID. So this is not a great time for us right now. There's a lot of stuff going on for kids and for the pediatricians that care for them. We are faced with a huge amount of anti-vax um, propaganda, anti-masking propaganda, shortages of our necessary protective equipment. Uh, we're having provider and staff shortages that are causing us to get behind and not be able to see as many sick kids. And then, of course, the sick kids themselves, it's hard to see them so sick and some of them dying. Families are losing their jobs and insurance, which definitely affects health care and affects the well-being of children. School failure, kid depression, obesity, and then some of the long-term effects of COVID on kids that we're seeing. So this is a time where we're feeling like, uh-oh, what is going to happen next and will we make it through to the other side? But let's take a look at where we are with the data and see where the hope lies. This is updated on the 13th of this month. We can see that um, in the United States as of 2019, there were over 75 million children in our country under age 18. And um, in terms of child cases of COVID, we're seeing over 9,452,000 cases of COVID since the beginning of COVID. So um, the the cumulative percent of children of total cases is about 17%, which is up drastically from the end of 2021 or the end of 2020 when it was actually closer to 12%. Um, and so what we've known so far is that over 9.5 million children have tested positive for COVID-19 as of the 13th of January, 2022. And 10% of those kids happened last week. And just wait till you see the rest of the graphs. 
Um, as of last week, we've seen 862 children die of this disease. This is um, a little bit of a history of how COVID surged over time. In April of 2020, we weren't seeing a lot of cases because people were masking and staying at home. And then right around October and November, we saw a huge surge of what I like to call the OG COVID, the original COVID-19, um, with a huge amount of, um, of infected cases. But you notice a huge drop as of January when the vaccines were released and people started coming in getting vaccinated. And then um, kind of fast forwarding to April, you can see um, the arrow shows when children ages 12 and up were able to get their vaccines. And so we saw a huge dip in the amount of COVID in the community. Um, right around um, July, we started seeing the resurgence of a new variant, Delta. And so uh, we started seeing an increase in the amount of cases as people started to unmask and go back into their communities, go back to the Iowa State Fair. Um, and then at, right around December, January, we see another huge peak as Omicron spikes. So this figure shows the number of child COVID-19 cases in the past week or so. So you can see that um, in January, COVID cases have skyrocketed to levels that we have never seen before. Let's talk about deaths in children in the United States. So these are the top reasons for childhood mortality in the United States. From one to four, you see that drowning is usually the leading cause. But now COVID is listed as one of the top 10 causes of death in children in the United States both in the one to four year old age range as well as the five to 14 age range. So um, in Iowa, this is Iowa specific data that you can find on the CDC webpage. What we know is that in Iowa, total cases of COVID are currently 631,000 and there have been over 8,000 deaths of Iowans due to COVID and then compare that with the total amount of cases in the country with 64.5 million cases of COVID and 847,000 deaths. In Iowa, I want you to take a look at the current seven-day metrics. So community transmission is high. That red dot means there's a lot of COVID out there. And as you saw from the previous graphs, more COVID than there's ever been. We've had um, over 35,000 cases in the last seven days. And the percent positivity is 25% or greater, meaning one in four people is experiencing COVID. Um, there have been over 182 deaths in the past seven days in Iowa. And then um, some good news is that we've seen the percentage of kids who've been vaccinated, or at least kids above age five and adults, to be 63. So that's kids plus adults. Um, so obviously tons and tons of new hospital admissions. Um, here is more specific data about vaccinations in Iowa, and I've circled my favorite stats. So um, I like to focus on kids, so population greater than five, and then population greater than 12. Um, so we're seeing that the population, percent of population greater than five years that's had been fully vaccinated is 63%. The population in Iowa greater than 12 is 68%. But I think that that is adding in both children and adults. So that skews it a little bit. Um, here is um, the U.S. average of vaccination. So of those who are fully vaccinated, the population greater than or equal to five years old is about 66%. So our percentage was 63%. And then here are the national averages. I was a tiny bit lower than um, the U.S. national average for the population being vaccinated. So we still have a little ways to go with getting our population vaccinated here in the state. Here's an update on um, children five to 11. So in the United States nationally, we've seen 7.5 million children between five and 11 have their first dose. That's only 27%. And then in the 12 to 17 year age range, we have seen 15.9 um, million children or 64% of children get at least one dose of their vaccination and then 13.3 million have had have in the 12 to 17 age range have been fully vaccinated. So um, here is 
a graph that shows the cumulative vaccination. So over 7.5 million, as I'd said, and um, have been vaccinated. Um, and then weekly, we can see kind of the patterns of when kids are getting their vaccinations. And this is the age 12, 12 to 17, when kids got their vaccinations. So you got, we saw a huge amount of kids coming out when the vaccines were first released. And this was my daughter, she was vaccinated right here. Um, and then we saw another spike in, hey, let's get our kids vaccinated during school, like right before school started. And now we're seeing just a tiny rise over here when we're like, okay, this may never end and Omicron is really serious. All right, so we've examined the statistics of what's happening out in the world and in our state with COVID-19 and kids. Let's learn a little bit more about how those vaccines work and why they're so important for kids. So um, as you have heard, the Pfizer vaccine that was released for children 12 to 17 was back in May of 2021. And that's when my child got her first one. And then the Pfizer vaccine for kids ages five to 11 was released in November of 2021. And then, um, after a long wait and after realizing that, hey, we're not over this yet, as Omicron surged, we saw a Pfizer booster that was available and offered to children in January of 2022. Um, we still um, have not had emergency authorization for children ages two to five or children younger than two. And we still don't have authorization for boosters for children ages five to 11 yet. Um, and here's just a review of which um, which of these vaccines have had um, approval to for emergency use. Pfizer, um, you have to get two doses and that can be anybody 12 and up that gets those. Um, and now of course you can do kids uh, five to 12 as well. And then the Moderna um, can be given to anyone 18 or above and then Johnson and Johnson, anyone 18 and above. So why should we get the vaccine? How does the, how does the virus work and how does the vaccine affect the uh, virus? So here is a really close up microscopic ex example of coronavirus, as you can see on the left. And you've probably heard all about how the circular virus is surrounded by these spikes all over it. And so this is what we refer to as the spike protein. And here is a human cell. Let's say this is a cell lining your respiratory system. And there is this receptor right here called the ACE2 receptor. So the spike, two, the spike protein is headed straight for that ACE2 receptor, um, and it needs to bind to that receptor in order to infect the cell. So that's the entry point. And as you can see, it kind of looks like a lock and a key. Um, so the idea behind the vaccine was if we block this protein over here, then there's no way that that lock can fit into that key. Therefore, that cell will not become infected. So again, here is another picture of how the binding process happens when the virus comes in and affects, uh, infects our cells. So um, this is somebody getting infected with COVID right now as that virus is injecting its genome inside to the cell and taking over um, our lung cells. But if you get your vaccine, specifically if you have one of those mRNA um, producing, spike protein producing vaccines, what happens is you produce these beautiful little antibodies and those antibodies recognize the spike protein and they come and they bind to the spike protein of coronavirus if you happen to be exposed to it. Therefore, that lock cannot even fit in, or that key cannot even fit into the lock. So the antibodies are blocking the protein from attaching to your cells so your cells stay healthy and you don't get sick. So just a review of what an mRNA vaccine is and how it works in your body. So um, scientists have identified the spike protein and then created this messenger RNA, this little message, and placed it into a vaccine. So when you inject the vaccine in, the message is transmitted through your cell membrane into your cell, but not into the nucleus of the cell. And um, your cell tr translates, the, so the, the um, mechanics of your cell is able to read this message, and the message tells it to make um, a spike protein. So then you create your own spike protein, but you don't have like the genome or anything else to inject anywhere. All you have is this little spike protein. And then your body says, hey, I see that spike protein, and I know that that's not supposed to be there. 
So your body begins producing antibodies against the spike protein. And that way, the antibodies are always present and ready to fight off if you happen to encounter any coronavirus cells. So your antibodies will come and they'll bind to these spike proteins and they will prevent the um, COVID uh, molecule from injecting itself into your cells and you will stay healthy. So this is why vaccines work is because you can actually create your defense mechanisms without getting sick. Next step is to learn why we should um, uh, vaccinate our children. So many people think that COVID in kids is just a benign illness, like a cold, and it should go away. And so we shouldn't be afraid of it and we shouldn't need to worry about it. And you know, we probably don't need to vaccinate, but that is actually not true. And these are all the reasons why I've vaccinated both of my children. First is breathing problems. When COVID infects those cells, it injects its own genome in there and damages and kills a lot of the cells in your respiratory tract, including your nose, including your lungs, and also infects other cells of your body, including cells in your brain. So um, it can create breathing problems both during acute COVID and later on in your life. So, um, you know, watching your child struggle to breathe is something that I do not recommend for any parent. Second, um, the, the genome of COVID can be injected into cardiac cells. And so that can cause either acute myocarditis, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and can cause long-term downstream negative effects on your heart. So I think a lot of people don't realize that your child, if they get COVID, they're actually very vulnerable to having some severe damage to their heart. Next, um, especially with the what I call the OG COVID, the original COVID and um, the Delta variant, we saw a lot of people losing their sense of smell and taste. I've seen it a little bit less with Omicron. When you lose your taste and smell, um, you're not actually losing it because of cells in your nose or cells on your tongue. It's because of your brain. And so inflammation in your brain affects the way you smell and taste, and that can actually have long-term effects on children's growth. Many children have reported that they find the taste of food disgusting after this, and many children are vulnerable, and um, it is possible for them to develop a condition called ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. If you find all food disgusting, you're not going to be able to eat, and you will lose weight at a time in your life where you are supposed to be well-nourished and growing. So very concerning about um, children and nutrition and growth. Developmental concerns, as I have said, um, for various reasons, COVID can have an, an impact in the way children are able to develop. So we see regression in speech, in, um, in gross motor skills and fine motor skills. We see uh, a lot of regression in uh, social and emotional development. And so um, we still don't know the long-term implications of how COVID can affect our young children's development. Next, brain fog. I don't know if any of you have had COVID, but if you do, brain fog is a real thing. The inability to concentrate, the delay in your effectiveness in getting things done, um, the delay in your effective communication is very significant and it affects children too. It affects the way they learn and the way they feel about school and the way they feel about themselves. So um, that sort of um, mental effort and fatigue has a huge impact on children during their school year. Let's not forget the physical fatigue. When you have COVID, oftentimes you feel like you can't even lift your head up off the pillow. One of my uh, friends who had COVID said, I had to choose if I was going to brush my teeth or wash my face because I only had energy enough for one. So there's a lot of physical fatigue that goes along with COVID that can last a long time. And although it is rare, children can develop long haul COVID, which means that they simply do not have energy for the long term. And we don't have enough evidence to know exactly how long it will last for kids, but it's very concerning when it develops. Headaches can be recurrent during COVID and can um, continue after COVID is over based on some of the damage that's done to some of the cells in the brain. And uh, we can also see a lot of mental and behavioral health concerns associated with being affected with COVID. Um, even just the stress of the pandemic has caused some mental health uh, strains on our children. There are new studies that suggest that COVID-19 infection can lead to increased incidence of diabetes, which we'll talk about. 
And then, of course, uh, the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children, which we'll also talk about. And then, of course, we certainly don't want our kids dying. So for all of these reasons, I recommend vaccines to every child who's eligible to get it. And I also recommend it for my own children. All right, so let's talk about one of the more familiar and well-known complications of COVID in children called the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have heard of it, but this is a brand new thing as of 2020 that didn't really exist before. So what we're seeing is between about two and six weeks after someone has had COVID, um, some children can develop a vasculitis type syndrome, which causes inflammation of organs, at least two of these organs, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your brain, your skin, your eyes, and or your gas gastrointestinal system. So um, this can cause lasting cardiac damage and, and or death in some children. So if you're worried, if you're like, will my kid get MISC, these are the things you should look for. First of all, you should know if your child has had COVID or not. So that means testing them. And then if they have had COVID and they develop these symptoms afterwards, then you should consider having them examined. So if they have severe abdominal pain and vomiting, bloodshot eyes that you can't explain for any other reason, like long lasting diarrhea in combination with some of these other things, dizziness and lightheaded or signs of low blood pressure, skin rash and vomiting. If you have combinations of those things, then they should seek care. There will be labs drawn, there will be fluids given, and there will be admission to the hospital with further stabilization and delivery of medications such as an infusion of IVIG, which is an immunoglobulin. So this, these are the statistics since COVID started of the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Um, there are not that many cases, but way too many cases. These are 6,431 cases more than we saw in 2019, right? Um, so a brand new illness that's very severe. We've seen 55 deaths across the country um, over this time. Um, the majority are male and the majority are black or Hispanic. And in Iowa, we have seen somewhere between 50 and 99 cases. So Let's look at um, the daily uh, MISC cases um, reported. And I think this is really an interesting graph because um, so what you're seeing is the dotted line is COVID-19 surges. And then you're seeing the MISC surges over time, right? So you can see when, when COVID starts, we see a surge in MISC. And then when COVID has a surge, we have a surge in MISC, right? So April, this was the OG original COVID, and that's when we saw a lot of cases of MISC. And then um, in November and December, this is also the OG, right? This was the big surge that caused my kids to have to leave school and go home. Um, and then a huge decline after vaccines were introduced. And then um, starting in August and September, where when Delta came, we saw a huge sur surge in MISC. So you can see the data stretch even up to the beginning of January. You can see the surge in Omicron and then not as much of a surge so far in MISC. So we can say at least sort of confidently that Omicron is less likely to give you MISC than some of the other variants. So COVID-19 myocarditis, what is that? What is myocarditis? So myocarditis is inflammation of your heart muscles which gives you symptoms like chest pain, palpitations, and shortness of breath. It makes it very difficult to even climb a set of stairs. This can be mild or it can be very severe and it can leave permanent damage or it can kill you. So it sometimes has been seen to be a side effect of getting the Pfizer vaccine in teen males. Um, the theory is because it may be due to the exaggerated immune response and it usually goes away on its own. So. Um, although it is a rare side effect of the mRNA vaccines, it is not deadly in that form and self-resolves in all cases. Um, whereas you can also get myocarditis with COVID-19. And in fact, you have a 37 times higher risk of getting myocarditis if you are unvaccinated. So if you were 
on the fence thinking, well, I don't want to vaccinate because what if I get myocarditis? If you stay unvaccinated, your chances are 37 times higher of having this problem. And I think it's important to know that um, if, uh, if you um, get COVID and you get myocarditis, it is much more severe than if you get the kind without with the vaccine. So children with moderate or severe COVID um, cannot necessarily jump right back into sports. They need to see their doctor. They need to be cleared for things like sports because of this potentially damaging effect of uh, your cardiac muscle. So I have some news for you, some new breaking news. As of January 7th, there was a, um, an article that was released um, looking at retrospective data from two large databases that show an increased incidence of new onset type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes, in children under age 18, about 30 days after they've had a COVID-19 infection. So this was beyond a coincidence. They were seeing in some studies, there was a 31% higher rate, and in other studies, 166% higher rate of having new onset diabetes. And I've been hearing this from pediatricians and endocrinologists ever since COVID began. They're like, wow, in the summer of 2020, we saw way more type one diabetes than we'd ever seen before. And it was usually related to someone who had had COVID in the past. So why? Well, the mechanism that's proposed is potentially a direct attack of your pancreatic cells or stress hyperglycemia. So when you have COVID, your body releases all the stress hormones and cytokines, and that can cause hyperglycemia. Or a precipitation of maybe you were already predisposed to having it, like you were on the borderline of having diabetes, and it just kind of tipped you over. Um, so what does this all mean for us? I think it means that, hey, we need to prevent as many kids as possible from getting COVID because I don't want this to happen to my kids. I don't want it to happen to your kids. Another new study has a little bit of hope, and I really love this study. The study that was released January 7th says if you have had um, two COVID vaccines by Pfizer, kids between the ages of 12 and 18, uh, they saw it was 91% effective in preventing the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children or MISD. So that is fantastic that if, for example, my child who is 14 has had two doses of her Pfizer vaccine and she recently got COVID, but she had a very mild, mild case. And now I can feel very confident that she is not going to develop MISD. So another reason to vaccinate our children. All right, another little light at the end of our tunnel is a discussion that was had at the American Academy of Pediatrics January 10th town hall. So um, from Bonnie Maldonado, who is the chair of the AAP Committee on Infectious Diseases, she says, from the data we've seen from South Africa, it does appear that, co that Omicron's rapid doubling time depletes the pool of susceptibles. That means, that means everyone's getting it. And then drops off pretty rapidly. So we are anticipating, based on the number of different models, that by February, most of Omicron should be done in the U.S. I'm gonna say fingers crossed, nobody can predict that, but we certainly hope that that's a light at the end of our tunnel. We are happy to see that whatever the surge is now, it should be short lived. I'm sure not short enough for everybody here, but hopefully it won't last more than a few weeks. So this is what's keeping me going. Okay, so let's do a little myth busting. Myth number one that I have heard in my practice are you know, the concern that there might be some weird ingredients in COVID vaccines. They're just worried of, we don't know what's in it. So here's the fact, nearly all the ingredients in your COVID vaccines are also ingredients that you just ingest in foods, fats, sugars, and salts. Um, they also have that messenger RNA, which I told you about before, which is kind of just like a little message um, that contains a little piece of the virus or a harmless version of the virus that has your body recognize it create antibodies to it and protect you. And COVID-19 vaccines do not contain preservatives. They don't have aborted fetal cells. They don't have antibiotics. They don't have food proteins, medicines, latex, or heavy metals. Myth number two, the natural immunity from getting COVID is better than getting my vaccine. So I've already had COVID, I'm immune. That's better than actually getting my vaccine. Well, that is not true. 
getting COVID-19 vaccine is safer and a more dependable way to build up your uh, antibody protection. So we know that from the previous discussions that we had that if you get COVID, you're more likely to see downstream effects such as MISC in children. If you get your vaccine, you are much less likely to see those downstream effects. So we have a more predictable immune response. We have um, those that are vaccinated are less likely to be hospitalized or die if um, they get COVID-19. And then vaccines provide added protection um, if you've already had COVID. So you might have um, antibody levels that are at a certain level, but you will boost them up much higher and be better protected. And then again, if you have had COVID and you decided not to get vaccinated, you're twice as likely to get COVID again. So um, myth number three, COVID vaccines contain microchips. Now, hopefully most of you that are in medical school, this mini medical school, probably think that's ridiculous because um, they definitely do not. So COVID-19 vaccines don't contain microchips. Vaccines are actually just there to help you stay healthy and they're not tracking your moves. Next myth, COVID vaccines make you magnetic. So nobody is magnetic except for this guy, Magneto from the X-Men. So receiving your COVID-19 vaccine will not make you magnetic. There's a lot of stuff on the internet, you guys. There's a lot of stuff. And there's stuff that you can believe and there's stuff that you shouldn't believe. So if it sounds kind of ridiculous, it's probably ridiculous. So always, um, you know, enter with a, a large amount of skepticism and hopefully use your scientific brain to realize that if there's no metals in the vaccine, then you can't be magnetic. Next myth, COVID-19 vaccine can give me COVID-19. I can see why people might be worried about that, right? People tell that to me all the time when I talk about getting your influenza vaccine. They're like, oh, last time I got the flu after I got my flu shot. Well, that's actually impossible. It's impossible for you to get COVID from the shot because um, none of the vaccines that you could get in the United States have an alive virus in them that could make you sick. So remember again that, especially with like the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna, they are coding for that spike protein. So it's just a, like a little message that gets sent to your cells to say, hey, could you please make the spike protein for me? You're not making the whole COVID virus. You're just making a piece of it. So your body makes the piece of it. And then your body says that's not supposed to be there. And then your body creates the antibodies. So you can see all that we're giving you is just a message. The way I like to think about it is this. Um, you see that at the bottom of this, there's a car and it doesn't have wheels, but do you still recognize it as a car? You definitely do. Can it drive over and get you? No, it cannot. It can't move because it doesn't have wheels. So that's kind of like what our vaccines are. Your body can recognize it and yet that vaccine actually isn't going to come after you. So hopefully that helps you feel a little safer with not only getting your COVID vaccine, but also your influenza vaccine. All right, myth number six, COVID-19 vaccines affect reproductive health. I get asked this question not infrequently, although I think people have come to realize that this is false. Um, the fact is that COVID-19 vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective in pregnant women. And COVID-19 does not affect your fertility. Where did this idea even come from? Well, some researchers took a look at the spike protein um, and they thought the antibodies against the spike protein look like maybe they could attack some of these little um, receptors on the placenta. But it turns out that actually they don't. They don't recognize the placenta. They don't attack the placenta. So there's no evidence at all that that is happening. And um, what we have seen is that fertility rates have remained the same from pre-COVID era to current COVID era. So nobody's having problems getting pregnant um, at any rates different from before. We also know that um, COVID-19 vaccine is now recommended for people who are trying to get pregnant or for people who are pregnant. Um, we also know that COVID-19 vaccines can offer antibody protection to newborns if you have vaccinated a pregnant person. So if you are a pregnant person who is not vaccinated, you are twice as likely to be hospitalized or hospitalized or die than if you are a not pregnant person who's not vaccinated. So it, so being pregnant actually is a risk factor for having severe COVID. So it is to your advantage to be vaccinated if you're pregnant. 
Um, other things that you just need to think about with COVID. Anybody age five and older can get a COVID vaccine. There are all oh, very, very few restrictions. One being if you've ever had a severe allergic reaction to a COVID vaccine. Number two, COVID vaccines help protect against severe illness, hospitalization, and death, but also those long-term problematic side effects that kids can experience. So please do not use the excuse of, well, it's going to be mild for my kids, so I'm not worried. And please don't use the excuse of, well, I'm just waiting to see what happens. Because I can tell you that if you wait to see what happens, it could actually be something terrible that happens to your child who's not vaccinated, such as MISD or diabetes or long COVID or developmental problems or brain fog that lasts forever. So please really, really think hard and, and try not to wait anymore because this is the time we're seeing huge, huge surges. Your child's less likely to get sick. They're less likely to pass COVID on to friends, loved ones, neighbors, and teachers. Um, it could prevent those problematic downstream effects. It could keep them in school. It could keep them learning. It could prevent the evolution of new variants. So the more people that are vaccinated, the less this is circulating in the community and the less likely we're, we are to see mutations. Uh, and then COVID vaccines will, again, help kids succeed in school, be with their friends more often, feel more confident, develop their social um, their social skills as they develop into adolescents and teens. And again, whatever risks there are, which there's nothing that's risk-free, the benefits far, far outweigh any risk. So here are my take-home points. Well, it is true that most children who get COVID have benign illness. There can be very serious disease and death and long-term side effects. COVID-19 vaccines are extremely effective and safe for children. The side effect profile for COVID-19 vaccines in adolescents is similar to adults. So sometimes you will see some fevers, some body aches, some sore throat, some lymph node swelling, um, and those should resolve over time. mRNA vaccines are associated with uh, rare cases of myocarditis, especially in males, but again, you will have a much higher risk of getting myocarditis from actually getting COVID and MISC. Vaccines do help kids from dying. They help them not get into the hospital or leave the hospital sooner. They help them from having long-term symptoms and they help maintain a normal-ish life, whatever that looks like these days, the new normal. So again, at every visit for pediatricians, whether they do physicals or they're taking care of kids in the inpatient or urgent care or ED, um, it's going to become routine that we ask about your COVID vaccine and that we help you get your COVID vaccine if you need it. So do it for the children. Everyone out here that's listening, get your COVID vaccines. And if you haven't had your booster yet, get your boosters. Um, there was some recent, um, uh, recently uh, released information that booster shots are actually very helpful and protective against um, reducing your chances of Omicron. Uh, continue good hand washing. Wear your masks when you're around large crowds and indoors test frequently and make sure to follow the CDC isolation and quarantine precautions for you and your children if you happen to get COVID. So again, this is a picture of my daughter and her superpowers after she got her second COVID vaccine. Thank you so much and I hope you found this helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Shriver. I know I enjoyed that presentation. I hope all of you watching at home did as well. Well, if you had any questions, big or small, please email them to questions at dmu.edu and we will be sure to get you an answer from Dr. Schreifer. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye-bye.